It is now time for question period. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Good morning, Speaker. Uh, this question is for the Premier. Brighton Council approved a six-month agreement for $60,000 with Atlas Strategic Advisors. I want to remind everyone, Atlas Strategic or At Atlas Strategies is a company led by the Premier's infamous Las Vegas massage table loving principal secretary Amin Masoudi. Boy, that's a mouthful. Atlas Strategies has now dropped the contract after they were exposed by recent reports for boasting about their relationship with the Premier's office. But the question is where did this town and the Minister of Labor's riding, the same minister with connections to Mr. X, get the idea that in order to get action from this government, they needed to hire a friend of the Premier to lobby for preferential treatment? Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Speaker. Frankly, uh, I don't know where uh, a town or any community in this province of Ontario would think that it would ever be a good idea to hire uh, an outside lobbyist to try to connect with uh, uh, the government or members of, uh, of this legislature. I would suggest to our municipal partners that should they want to meet with members of the legislature that they pick up uh, a phone, go to a computer or come to this place and talk to us. I know that members of this caucus are always available to our partners and I think the dollars, the dollars that are spent on uh, outside consultants would be better spent on focusing on infrastructure and other things that move their communities forward and not on outside lobbyists. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the contract is for lobbying, for grant writing support, for consultation, and for advisory services to improve Brighton's chances for funding, approval, and provincial support. But a councillor said this. Put plain and simple, it's a lobbyist to work the back room. That's what we are getting. We are not acquiring them for their technical expertise. I guess what happens in Brighton doesn't stay in Brighton. Is the Premier really okay with his government's reputation of catering to insiders in the back rooms? Again, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, let me, uh, let me be very clear uh, to uh, our uh, our partners, our municipal partners, uh, uh, they should focus on doing and spending their resources, the resources of their taxpayers, on things that move their communities forward. Uh, I have heard as Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, as have all my colleagues, the importance of building water and wastewater, other infrastructure. Uh, so I say very clearly to them, uh, focus those resources on that. Should you wish to reach out to members of this legislature, do so. Uh, we encourage you to do so. We have Roma, we have AMO, uh, we have NOMA. Many of our ministers just came back from Sudbury, where they were meeting with municipal leaders. You have a premier who hands out his cell phone number to every single Ontarian, Mr. Speaker, and I know that is the same process Spons. that many of our colleagues on this side do, uh, uh, Speaker. So, uh, very clearly, again, uh, to any municipal council that is watching, focus your resources on what matters to your people. You. The, the final supplementary. Say, Speaker, that uh, municipalities seem to have gotten a very different message from this government. And this is a concerning pattern we are seeing from this government and from, and let me tell you that people across the province are indeed taking notice. This government made such a reputation of catering to insiders and the Premier's friends that local governments are using it as a strategy. One councillor said this, this government sometimes talks to its friends more than other folks. It might as well work for us from time to time. <laughs> Backroom deals. Vegas massage tables, RCMP criminal investigations. I'm going to ask again, is this Premier going to tell us today whether he is okay with that being the legacy of his government? Members will please take their seats. Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think what uh, we will be proud of as the legacy of this government is the continued legacy of economic growth, job creation, Mr. Speaker. 
We're proud of a legacy that is building more schools and communities across the province of Ontario. We're proud of a legacy that is building transit and transportation for the first time in over a generation across the province of Ontario. We're proud of a legacy that has brought over $40 billion worth of investment to the province of Ontario, a legacy that includes over 700,000 jobs in the province of Ontario, a legacy that is building hospitals in small and large and medium-sized communities across the province of Ontario, a legacy that is reducing the cost to taxpayers across the province of Ontario, a legacy that is opening up the Ring of Fire in the north so that the people in northern Ontario can help drive the prosperity that comes with the over $40 billion of investment in the new auto across this province, Mr. Speaker. But what the people of Ontario know is that the job is not done, that we inherited a fiscal and economic mess from the previous government. The work needs to continue. We're not done yet, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, this question is again for the Premier. A few weeks ago, ACORN organizers from across the province led funeral marches to mourn the death of affordable housing in Ontario. Over the last decade, the average rent in Ontario has shot up at least three times, uh, uh, three times the guideline rate. And you know, I tell you, Speaker, that is just too darn high. One of the first things that this government did was to take away rent control for tenants living in new buildings, allowing these big corporate landlords to raise the rent to whatever they wanted. And last year, a tenant here in Toronto faced a rent increase of $7,000 per month. Why does the Premier think that corporate landlords should be allowed to raise rent by $7,000? Lot, haven't we, colleagues? We talked about a program that was brought in by the NDP government between 1990 and 1995, and that was to remove rent controls from new purpose-built buildings because they were unable to get starts in the province of Ontario at that time, following a, a half decade of disastrous Liberal government. Mr. Speaker, what we are doing is, is has seen the highest amount of purpose-built rentals in the history of the province. Mr. Speaker, putting more supply online. And when you talk about affordable housing, colleagues, what we inherited in 2018 was an absolute disaster. And we have had to focus the last six years on renovating, rehabilitating, restoring old, outdated affordable housing to the tune of 123,000 units across the province of Ontario. You know why? Because for 15 years, they, supported by them, did nothing. They didn't care about the tenants that lived in those affordable housing units. Spons. We're investing billions to make sure that those units are up to code. And not only that, that they're beautiful places for people to move, live, and create memories going forward. A supplementary question. Well, Speaker, I'd say the minister needs to get with this, this century and the reality of people today. You know what happens when you get rid of rent control? Two things. First, corporations make more money off people who have no money, and then rent goes up and people lose their homes. That's what happens. And you know why? Because unethical corporate landlords know that if they can get rid of their existing tenant, they can raise the rent to whatever they want. The NDP, we have called over and over for this government to take away this harmful incentive. We need to protect the, apply, the supply that we already have of affordable housing by bringing in stronger rent control. Why won't this Premier ensure any new tenant will pay what the previous tenant would have paid? Members, please take their seats. To respond. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. What the uh, Leader of the Opposition would do, and what they constantly do, right, is they we talked about this yesterday, right? They create enemies out of everybody, right? So if you are somebody that builds a home, you're an enemy. If you're somebody that builds affordable rental housing, you must be an enemy because that is what the NDP want to do. They want to drive down the province of Ontario. But what are we doing? We're building up the province of Ontario. The policies that we have brought in have seen the highest level of purpose built rental housing in the history of the province. But more importantly, Mr. Speaker, more importantly, we inherited a province where affordable housing was on the brink of collapse, where so many of our units were outdated, they were needed to be renovated, that we had to move people out of those units. We had to move people out of those units across the province of Ontario because they were unfit to be lived in. Why? 
because for 15 years the Liberals, supported by the NDP, Response. refused to make those investments. We have made investments so that 123,000 units can be lived in by people, Mr. Speaker, and lived in in dignity in communities that they're helping to build. And the final supplementary. I'll tell you what we will never do, Speaker. We will never uh, support anyone Order. who exploits hard-working working people Order. in the province of Ontario. We will never be friends with them. I want to talk about another loophole that is exploited, and that's the above guideline increase, or what we call AGI. Last month, CBC found that over half of all AGI applications came from just 20 large corporate landlords, friends of this government. Speaker, AGIs are supposed to be used just for things like extraordinary and unexpected expenditures that aren't covered by basic rent. I'm explaining this to the members opposite so they can follow along. But the government is allowing AGIs for things like routine maintenance or for luxury renovations that aren't necessary. So I want to ask the Premier Question. again, when will this government crack down on the unethical use of AGIs? Mr. Mr. And let me go a step further, Mr. Speaker, because we, we, uh, we've also talked about just how irrelevant the NDP have come. Let's remember that Ontario has the strongest rent control guidelines in the, pro in the country. In the country, 2.5% is, is what we allow, right? We still have rent controls. Now, there is not one, not one purpose-built rental housing provider in the province of Ontario that has done what she is suggesting has happened. Not one. They are keeping rents down. They are within the guidelines, Mr. Speaker. That is what is happening across the province of Ontario. Our purpose-built rental housing communities are doing what they're supposed to do, provide affordable housing in communities where people want to live so that they can build better lives for themselves. And more importantly, Mr. Speaker, they can live in communities that they are helping to build. And you know why? Because this government has removed obstacles. We have put in place the rules and the guidelines and the supports brought on by this Minister of Finance that is getting people back into the business of building purpose-built rental housing. Imagine, under our policies, Response. the highest level of purpose-built rental housing, not in a decade, not in two decades, but ever. That's what we're doing. The next question, the member for University, Rosedale. Speaker, I want to talk about how the housing crisis is affecting people, Minister. Maria is a senior in my riding. She looks after her disabled son. She pays $3,640 a month for two rooms and a home because it's all she can find in Toronto. She's due to be evicted in three days because she cannot afford the rent. She's looking to move into a shelter, but that means she'll be separated from her disabled adult son. Maria is one of 65,000 people who are on a wait list for an affordable home. She's been waiting 12 years. Minister, do you think it's acceptable that a senior is being forced to move into a shelter because there is no available affordable housing? Minister, Ms. Paul Ferries and Housing. It, it, it proves my point. The question in itself proves my point, doesn't it, Mr. Speaker? So for 15 years, they kept them in power. And for 15 years, this coalition here the same as the federal coalition, refused to invest in affordable housing. In fact, what they did, Mr. Speaker, is condemn people who lived in that type of housing to units that were old, units that were outdated. They forced people to move out of those units, Mr. Speaker, because they were below code. What Opposition come to order. We have renovated, across the province of Ontario, 100 and 23,000 units while unleashing the power while unleashing the power of Ontario's building and construction crews so that they could build the highest Response. level of purpose-built rentals in the history of the province but she is right the job is not done and that's why Ontarians will prompt us to move forward supplementary Minister, Maria is not going to be able to afford to move into a new purpose-built rental that costs over $3,000 a month to live in. It's not going to happen. Minister, I want to talk about Helen. 
Helen is a new parent. A developer bought her home and the eight homes next to her, and now the developer is systematically kicking out the tenants one by one. The developer is no longer doing basic repairs, like stopping sewage from leaking through the ceiling, making the homes unlivable, and the developer is also uh, filing eviction notices saying family members are about to move in. These are clearly illegal actions. Minister, do you think it's acceptable that big landlords are allowed to engage in illegal activity to drive out tenants from their homes? Mr. Mr. Repairs and Housing. Boy, that's a tough question to answer, isn't it? Of course it's not. Of course it's not, Mr. Speaker, and that's why Order. we have rules in place in the Order. province of Ontario that are simply the most difficult and most challenging rules in the country. If a landlord treats a tenant unfairly, the laws will deal with that landlord, Mr. Speaker. But what is more important, and again, Order. here, question after question after question after question. If you produce something in Ontario, the NDP don't like you. If you build something in Ontario, the NDP don't like you. If you drive a road on, in Ontario, they don't like you. You go to a school or a university, they don't like you. The only thing the NDP want to do is drive down the province of Ontario. And how does the province of Ontario respond? They drive down the results of the NDP in every single election. When you're, when you're fighting elections, and other gets more votes than you do, you might be on the wrong path, Mr. Speaker. We'll keep on the path. Of Next question, the member for Brantford Grant. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. Great Minister. Great Minister. Speaker, the federal carbon tax has been a failure on every level. It has not reduced emissions, and it has increased the cost of everything in the province of Ontario. To continue to drive economic growth and electrification in our province, we need better access to affordable and clean energy, not this punitive tax. The Trudeau Liberals, supported by the NDP and the Queen of the Carbon Tax herself, Bonnie Crombie, felt no shame or remorse about hiking this tax 23 per cent last month. Speaker, they will bring more tax hikes at every opportunity that they get to the people of Ontario. The Liberals and their carbon tax must be stopped. Speaker, can the minister please enlighten the opposition members and tell them how we can build Ontario's clean energy advantage without imposing this regressive carbon tax? Thank you. Member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, and Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Energy. And I want to thank the member for Brantford Brant for the question. And yes, we can. We have a plan called the Powering Ontario's Growth, and it does not include a carbon tax. In fact, we are vehemently against the carbon tax, especially one that went up 23 per cent on April 1st, supported by Justin Trudeau, Jagmeet Singh, and of course the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, who leads the Liberal Party here. We are bringing clean, reliable, affordable energy by refurbishing our nuclear fleet. All the major component replacements are on time or ahead of time and on budget. Speaker, we know what Ontario needs to build the jobs in the future, the economy. Why do you think we're getting $43 billion of investment in our automotive sector? Because we, they know, those people know, we have a nuclear advantage and it will power Ontario for generations to come. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the parliamentary assistant for his response. Speaker, it is unacceptable that the federal Liberals continue to drive up the cost of everything and make our basic necessities unaffordable. That's why we need the NDP and Liberal members in this House to recognize these detrimental impacts and join us in fighting the carbon tax. Unfortunately, Speaker, they just won't do it. While the Liberals and NDP want to dive deeper into the pockets of Ontarians, our government will continue to get it done for the people of Ontario, meet our growing energy needs, and deliver solutions with real affordability. Speaker. Can the parliamentary assistant please explain what steps our government is taking to build a clean energy future in this province without the carbon tax? Thank you. Again, the member for Renfrew, Mr. Singh, Pembroke. 
Speaker, well, thank you for thank you and thank you to the member for the question again. As I said, our government's powering Ontario's growth plan, powering Ontario's growth. Everything for Ontario's history or uh, future hinges on its ability to grow, to provide the jobs and the future for the next generations. And how do you do that? You've got to make sure you have the policies in place. We have the policies in place that are going to help us build 1.5 million homes. You're going to need energy for those homes. You're going to need energy for the people that are going to live in those homes and energy for the people that build those homes. Our nuclear advantage, our clean energy advantage in Ontario is attracting attention all around the world. We are bringing back the $700,000 700, jobs that the Liberals lost 300000 of when they were in power, largely because of their failed energy policy. Our energy policy will power Ontario today and power it into the future, and Ontarians will be better off as a result of that. And we won't have a carbon tax. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Premier. Last year, the former Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing began an audit of municipal governments after the Premier claimed municipalities were wasting money. With seemingly no explanation, Brampton, Caledon, Mississauga, Newmarket, Toronto, and the Region Appeal were selected for audits. Then, just as quickly, without sharing any results, the audits were cancelled. My question, did the minister cancel and hide his predecessor's audit because they failed to find significant waste at City Hall? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I, you know, <laughs> when your leader starts the first question about a municipality wasting money on a lobbyist, maybe your fourth question of the day shouldn't be, our municipal partners aren't necessarily wasting uh, money. Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, and maybe that's why the NDP are so irrelevant in in uh, in political discourse today, uh, Speaker. What we're doing, what we're doing across the province Order. of Ontario, is we're working with our municipal partners to make important investments for them. They have told us that they need money for infrastructure. They need money so that they can build sewer and water capacity to build the 1.5 million homes across the province of Ontario, so we're getting that done for them. They've told us that they need assistance with infrastructure so that we can get those investments that have led to $40 billion worth of game-changing investments across the province of Ontario, which has led to 700,000 jobs being created in the province of Ontario. You know why we need to do this? Because we inherited an infrastructure deficit from the previous Liberal government. We're changing it, but the work is not done. More Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, no one has seen the results of these audits, not even the local governments that provided all the necessary documents that were to be audited. Freedom of information requests to see these reports have been denied by the ministry. We suspect the government is keeping the reports under wraps because they failed to find significant waste. Through you, Speaker, what did the ministry find during those audits, and when will they release these hidden reports? To reply, the Premier. First of all, Mr. Speaker, no one can convince Order. me that there isn't Order. waste at all governments. The only difference is our government, we're finding the waste. We're the only region, think of this, we're the Order. only region, the only province in all of Canada, in the history of Canada, that's not a waste of tax. We believe in growth. We believe in making sure that we, we have the buildings. Here's a, here's a stat that just came out. Toronto tops the list of most cranes anywhere. Order. Okay, so here we go. Toronto is tops at 221, not including the GTA, that's just as many. We have more cranes in the sky than Los Angeles that have 50, Seattle 38, Denver 14, Boston 14, Washington DC 12, Honolulu 12, Las Vegas 10, Portland 9, San Francisco Response. 8, Phoenix 7, New York Five, Chicago three, and Dallas zero. Something's going right because we created the environment for companies. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kitchener South Hesler. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the 
Minister of Education, a few weeks back, I brought a motion to this House calling on the government to restrict the use of smartphones in, uh, in classrooms and to also ban the use of vapes and other uh, harmful uh, products. That motion was passed unanimously after a number of my colleagues, government, uh, opposition and independents, spoke very eloquently in support of it. Um, I brought that motion because what I heard from constituents and parents, uh, more than one in four uh, Ontario students have picked up vaping, and as a former PPSE uh, pre federal drug prosecutor, I don't really have a problem getting behind that, um, but it was also what I heard about smartphones. I especially want to call out um, the work of a uh, great Kitchener doctor, uh, Dr. Allison Young, known online as the Smartphone Effect MD, who has uh, really brought an evidence-based sort of one-woman advocacy attack on the, uh, the impact of smartphone use. Um, Following that, the ministry brought an announcement about new uh, uh, efforts to combat smartphones and vapes in classrooms, and I would appreciate it if sure. the minister could please elaborate on what the government is doing. Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I do want to thank the member from Kitchener, South Hesper, uh, another fellow millennial, not ironically taking action to restrict cell phones and technology in schools. Uh, I want to note, Mr. Speaker, that two weeks ago we announced a plan to get cell phones out of sight and out of mind when it comes to our schools, and it's overwhelmingly supported by Ontario families. 87% of Ontarians agree we have a problem, and they support our solution to restrict cell phone technology during instructional time. We have to empower our educators. Give them the enforcement tools and the confidence that when they ask a student to remove their device, that their superintendents and directors will have their back, and this government will stand with our teachers. We're asking parents to speak with their kids to recondition them to this behaviour because the mental health data is clear. The academic data is clear. The impacts of technology and cell phones without proper safeguards are limiting the ability of children to learn and to develop in a positive way. It is impacting Response. their development. And so we've taken action, we've paved the way for national leadership to restrict social media, to restrict cell phone use, and to outright ban vaping in the province. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I, uh, I have to say it was incredibly gratifying to see the ministry take such prompt action on something that really um, showed that they heard the concerns of the entire House based on a unanimously passed motion. I have to say I have never received more positive responses online um, until I brought that motion, and those responses really crossed, they crossed cultural, religion, <laughs> income lines. This is something that Ontarians clearly care about. It's something that got cross-party support, and it's something that that um, I really, really think shows the commitment that this government has and this minister has to making sure that students have a safe and supportive learning environment. Um, tell me, um, you know, I'm asking, Speaker, if the minister can, can talk about how the government is planning to continue this positive momentum that we have for something that it's so evident that all Ontarians uh, support, care for, and are marshalling behind. The Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Um, you know, it is so important that we get this right, which is why we are announcing an expansion of mandatory learning in the curriculum dealing with the responsible use of technology, online citizenship, privacy, consent, and to further strengthen the knowledge on the perils of vaping and cannabis and nicotine, an illegal substance for a child under 18 in this province. We're announcing funding in partnership with the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions to leverage community-based mental health and addiction services. We are expanding mandatory training of our staff. We're empowering parents through parent involvement councils to drive localized campaigns at the school level. We're also investing $30 million in vape detectors, and I'm proud that today the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery and I announced our intention to bring forth social media executives and tech experts and law enforcement to the government to meet with us with one mission, to safeguard the algorithms, Spons. to safeguard the privacy rights of children and actually improve the safety of kids in this province. The next question, the member for Parkdale, Hyde Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. If the Premier has been to a grocery store lately, he would know that groceries are too darn expensive. People can't afford to eat properly. Parents can't feed their kids nutritious food. Ontarians are so fed up with the lack of action by this Conservative government, they've taken matters into their own hands and started a boycott against Loblaws, the largest grocer in Canada. The NDP has long called for a consumer protection watchdog. Premier, will you accept our call and restore integrity in the grocery sector? 
to apply the premier let's, let's start with restoring integrity with the ndp and liberal that are all for this carbon tax that have increased the the cost of gas by 23 percent you know folks in the crowd you go up and fill up your tank now it's 23 percent higher you know when you deliver groceries uh, uh, or, or meat or produce, it goes on a truck. When they print something on those products, Order. that gets taxed too through the carbon tax. Carbon tax is the worst single tax we've ever seen in this country. Even Windsor the Bank West of Canada is saying it's driving up inflation. What we need to do is get rid of this carbon tax. It's the worst tax. It hits the people in their pockets. Let's ask the tax. Order. It's a supplementary question. Back to the Premier. The Premier doesn't want to talk about price gouging, but that's what's happening. Yep. On the day the boycott began, Loblaws posted a first quarter revenue of over $13 billion, with profits going up almost 10 percent. Your inaction will drive more people to the food banks, and you know that even food banks are running out of food. Mm -hmm. What do you have to say to parents who struggled to pack a lunch for their children this morning? Right <laughs> order. Opposition, come to order. 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 Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Yeah, yeah and I hear it. Uh, so if you're a farmer who produces food, the NDP think you're a, an enemy. If you're a grocer who sells the food, the Order. NDP thinks you're uh, an Order. enemy. I was, uh, I was at the Wellesley Fruit, uh, the fruit uh, Market. It's on Wellesley and uh, just, uh, just uh, west of, uh, of Parliament. And there's a guy who goes every single morning. He goes to the, the food terminal. He buys all his produce. Uh, uh, an extraordinary uh, uh, individual uh, who works Order. very, very, very hard. And you know what he said to me? The exact same thing that the, the Premier is talking about, right? When he goes there, he has to pay a carbon tax to drive there, bring his produce back. Everybody who delivers when he's at the terminal, they talk about the same thing. The farmers are talking about how expensive it has become to produce because of the carbon tax. We heard it from the Spons. greenhouse growers just the other day. The cost of a carbon tax is incredible, adding extra cost to the price of food. So I say really to the Thank you. Thank you. Order. The next question, the member for Orleans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and good morning. I wanted to ask my question to the political minister from Ottawa, but I realized he's not elected to this place, Mr. Speaker. In fact, he's never been elected. So my question is to the Premier. The person the Premier recently named as his political point man in Ottawa is the newest passenger on the Conservative gravy train, a former lobbyist and executive with Shoppers Drug Mart, and of course the failed candidate in Kanata Carleton. The announcement was met with near universal criticism, Mr. Speaker. Some people thought the hell froze over because even the member of Nepean agreed with me on that one, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Ottawa is Ontario's second largest city, over a million people. We deserve an elected voice around the cabinet table, not a political appointee dispatched as if we're some far flung. Uh, some far flung place in need of an ambassador. Will the Premier explain why his defeated candidate from Canada is up to the job when he clearly believes his three MPPs from Ottawa are not? Order. Order. Government House Leader. Ottawa is the second largest city in the province of Ontario, one of the most important cities in the country. One of the most important cities in the country, represented by Conservatives. Across the board. Member for Hamilton for Mountain, come to order. Member for Toronto Centre, come to order. You know why we have an office in Ottawa? It should have been there many years ago. Like the federal government has offices in every other major city. But you know why? Because we are undertaking the largest expansion of health care in the history of Ottawa. The largest expansion of health care in the history of Ottawa. Because we've come to a new deal with the city of Ottawa to upload some of the roads to ensure that they can progress, Mr. Speaker. You know what the mayor of Ottawa said? That it is a game changer for the city of Ottawa. You know what the other people Bonds. in Ottawa are saying? That for so many years they have been ignored by liberal politicians, and finally they have a conservative government that cares about them. That is. Order. 
Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Even the Ottawa Sun, not exactly a bastion of Liberal support, even the Ottawa Sun slammed the deal. Let me quote the Sun. Reports were coming in of a rare sighting of an Ontario Premier in Ottawa last week, like an errant booby bird accidentally blown in from a faraway tropics of Lake Ontario. Let me further quote. The mayor rolled out the welcome mat for the Premier, but his announcement while in town suggests he still sees us as a doormat. The Ford government ambassador to Ottawa was so committed to representing the voices of the people that he failed to attend all candidates' meetings during his own election in Canada. If he wasn't willing to show up for the residents of the riding he was trying to represent, why should we believe he'll show up for the rest of us in Ottawa? It's grasping at straws, Mr. Speaker, but the rest of us know better. This is just another gravy train appointment, Question. putting a lobbyist and a conservative insider in a highly paid position of power and authority over top of his three MPPs from Ottawa. When will the Premier recognize Ottawa as an important place in Ontario and designate— Thank you. Yeah. Order. Order. The reply, the Premier. Let, let me get this right. He's been an MPP there for years. Premier McGuinty was from Ottawa. You held a lot of seats in Ottawa until we came into play and then we wiped you guys out. Let's, let's just run South through this. What is it? Over $10 billion, second largest hospital project in the country, <laughs> making sure we get that done. We put billions of dollars into transit that your previous mayor totally turned order. into a disaster. We just announced a Barnsdale cutoff. I think I've been there four times. Order. Order. The Premier. 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 Please take your seat. Please take your seat. The member for Ottawa South is warned. The Premier still has some time and can resume his answer. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. We sent hundreds of millions of dollars to Ottawa. We have an incredible relationship with the mayor of Ottawa and the people there. People realize that we're showing love to Ottawa that they've never seen in 15 years. And your buddy sitting beside you, he's from Ottawa. You guys did diddle. Thank you. Thank you. The member for Niagara West will come to order. The member for Orleans will come to order. The member for Ottawa Centre will come to order. The member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. The next question. The member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. The Liberal carbon tax continues to make life more unaffordable for families in Ontario and across the country. <clears throat> Ever since the introduction of this disastrous tax, the cost of food, transportation and everyday essentials have reached new heights. Contrary to what Liberal members in this legislature have said, the carbon tax is not the best interest of Ontarians. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, don't take my word for it. Ask any Ontarians and they will tell you the same thing. Even the Liberal Premier of Newfoundland, Labrador, opposes a federal carbon tax. Really? While the independent Liberals, under the leadership of the carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie, continue to champion the aggressive tax, our government is standing up for Ontarians and calling for its elimination. Speaker, can the minister please Question. tell this House why the carbon tax needs to go? The member for Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, the Parliamentary Assistant Minister of Energy. The member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills, for his excellent question as well. You know, he spoke about what did wasn't one of those words? Essentials. Essentials. Driving up the cost of essentials. Now, how, how much crueler can you get than when you're driving up the cost of essentials? And you know, all across the supply chain. Our farmers, they don't just feed cities, they feed all of us, but the cities should understand it better than anyone. They should understand it. Our, everything that a farmer puts into that products, when they finally make it to the shelves or make it to your kitchens, those costs have been driven up by the carbon tax. The Liberals and Bonnie Comrie, 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 Crombie. Crombie, they are happy to let, they are happy to let, okay, John, we'll get you. Well, thank you, John. They're happy. 
to let people suffer under the burden of that carbon tax. But we, in the PC government under Premier Ford, are not. Farmers feed cities, farmers feed us all. Everything in the supply chain is, chain is driven up by that carbon tax. It is time to axe the tax. Remind the members make their comments through the chair and refer to each other by a writing name or ministerial title as applicable. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks you for, to the parliamentary assistant for the response. The carbon tax is unfair to every Ontarian, including the hardworking men and women that grow high-quality, healthy food for our families. Not only does it hike production costs for farmers, but it bunches those who are already utilizing environmentally responsible practices. Speaker, the federal Liberals and their provincial counterpart need to stop, step up and do the right thing. Stop ignoring families, businesses and farmers. Scrap this tax now. Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant please explain how the federal carbon tax is Order. negatively impacting Ontario farmers? Member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you to the member again for a supplementary question. And yeah, this is all about farmers and the food supply and what the carbon tax is doing it. You know, on the farm, and I want to thank our Minister of Agriculture for how she continuously supports our farming communities out there. But there's not many things on that farm that aren't driven by energy costs as well. And we know last week we had the Toga folks here, the Ontario Greenhouse Alliance, and how their costs are driven up because of the carbon tax. Because how much? 30 percent, 30 percent, the minister tells me, because if you've got greenhouses, they've got to be heated. If you're drying grain, that requires heating, whether it's propane or natural gas, it requires heating, it requires energy. Everything that happens on that farm is affected by the carbon tax. And for those people out there, they, have to, they really have to focus on understanding what that tax is doing to the cost of food on their tables. It's an absolutely wrong-headed way to try to raise revenue. The federal government, under Justin Trudeau, Bonnie Crombie, has to stand up. And the NDP, if you want to be recognized properly, Bonds. stand with us in Preview Ford and, and be just like we are. Ask them to scrap the tax. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Car thefts are on the rise, and we are not doing everything we can in the province. Recently, OPP Commissioner Thomas Carreek told a House of Commons committee that inspections of vehicles with problematic VINs should be mandatory, but Ontario doesn't do it. In Ontario, someone can steal a car, register it, and no one checks. This isn't just a loophole, it's a drive through lane for car thieves. So will this government commit to VIN inspections and actually protect Drivers from car theft. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. There's no government in the history of Ontario that has taken public safety more seriously than this government led by Premier Ford. And he leads it every day by saying that it is absolutely crazy that our doors are getting kicked in at five in the morning and people are demanded to hand over their keys. But you know what, Mr. Speaker, our government is acting. That's why we came forward with two asks for the government in Ottawa, the federal government. Have minimum sentencing on those people that think it's okay to steal our cars, number one. And number two, step it up at the ports of Montreal and at the rail ports and in the intermodals where we are not inspecting the containers going outbound the same as they are inspecting them coming inbound. It's so simple. The federal government has an opportunity, and you know what? The NDP across the way can call their friends in Ottawa and say, we stand for public safety. This is unacceptable. Fine. The supplementary question, back to the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. People are understandably worried about having their vehicle stolen. Vehicle theft is so common in the province of Ontario, we were even a recent punchline on Jeopardy. But stolen vehicles and shipping containers make the news. 10% of stolen vehicles are staying right here in Ontario. They're being re-vinned, resold, and re-registered at Service Ontario like any other vehicle. It has been reported that there is no VIN verification in Ontario, and there is no system for flagging suspicious registrations for inspections. The integrity of the VIN database 
is not being protected and is currently being flooded with false records and stolen vehicles. Can this government, this government of the province, explain why Ontario does not have a system for VIN verification? So let, let's get this straight. You're talking about the police. That you're, you're anti-police. Everyone knows NDP. Do not support our police. It's, it's a known fact. You guys aren't too bad, but you've done nothing over the last 15 years. So that's why our government is investing. Premier, to make his comments through the chair. That repeat violent offenders comply with bail conditions. I personally led the charge to the federal government about bail reform. I personally talked to the Prime Minister about mandatory sentences. We want to make sure that we have scanners at the ports, as the Solicitor General said. Our investment is going towards the creation of a new bail compliance and warrant apprehensive grant, the expansion of OPP repeat offenders bureau enforcement squad, establishment for of Hamilton intensive West, serious violent crime bail terms, Mr. Speaker, Spons. and teams, and a new provincial bail monitoring system to allow police services to monitor high-risk offenders with the most accurate possible Thank you. Thank you. The Premier will take his seat. The Premier will take his seat. The next question, the member for Don Valley North. Thank you, Speaker. My question is uh, for, it, for the Associate Minister of Mental Health. Speaker, with deep concern, I want to drop attention for the cities of Toronto's application to Health Canada to decriminalize drugs for personal use. The drugs we are talking about here, shockingly, include dangerous opioids such as heroin, fentanyl, and cocaine. Speaker, we know we are in the midst of an opioid crisis. The experience in BC and Oregon shows that this approach is a total failure. As the overdose deaths spiked high, as well as the street disorder and public safety concern, my constituents are deeply disturbed, disturbed that the city is pursuing this action. Speaker, can the minister explain what is the government Question. doing to address this issue? Thank you, Speaker. The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for that important question. The Premier last week was very clear. We do not support Toronto's application. As a member rightly noted, the jurisdictions that have attempted decriminalization, both here in Canada and internationally, are in full retreat from the policy because it does not work. I also want to point out, Mr. Speaker, that what Toronto requested was even more extreme, I'd say bizarre, than what they had in BC. The Medical Officer of Health's proposal is to decriminalize the possession of any drug in any quantity, wow. and are you ready, for people of any age, oh. and that includes children. This is known as the Made in Toronto solution. I think it's more like the Made in Toronto disaster waiting to happen. It's a completely reckless plan that would damage public safety, Response. wouldn't accomplish anything to help those struggling with addiction, and is not supported by this government. Mr. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And thanks to the Minister for his comments. Speaker, my constituents are so relieved to see all of us approval on PC's request for a ban on public drug use. BC Premier said, and I quote, keeping people safe in our, is our highest priority. While we are caring and compassionate for those struggling with addiction, we do not accept street disorder that makes community feel unsafe, end of quote. Speaker, I agree with Premier Ford's comment to give them treatment and support is the right thing to do. Speaker, my follow-up question is, can the minister tell Ontarians what is this government's plan to help those who are struggling with addiction? Thank you, Speaker. The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, our approach is very, very clear. 
its treatment, its recovery, and its prevention. In partnership with the incredible mental health and addictions organizations that are here today, we're making targeted, data-driven investments to build a recovery-oriented continuum of care. As a government and as a sector, we are aligned. We're going to meet people where they are, but we're not going to let them stay there. We're going to help them get to where they can be. We're opening new treatment beds, Mr. Speaker, in communities across the province, including in places like the North, where they were ignored for years and years under previous governments. We're also standing up new mobile crisis intervention teams, like the one that was announced yesterday in Lambton County. And we're also standing up, Mr. Speaker, to do what is correct for the people of the province of Ontario by looking after and Bonds. mental health and addictions and taking the issue seriously. We will not leave people where they are. We're going to help them be the best they can be. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Halliburton, Corth Lakes Broad. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. I continue to hear from my farmers in Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock, that the federal Liberal carbon tax is sending their bills through the barn roof. I have seen invoices from Midnight Acres Farm in Kawartha Lakes, Dave Frew Farms in Durham, that the carbon tax on their bills is adding five to ten thousand dollars per month, and that was before the most recent hike on April the first. We know good things grow in Ontario, and all Ontarians rely on Ontario farmers to produce the food we eat every day. The federal Liberals need to wake up and realize the detrimental effects that this punishing carbon tax is having on their farm operations. Can the minister tell us what she has been doing to help make the federal Liberals listen to Ontario farmers? Mr. Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, we're on the ground with our farmers standing with them, and I have to reflect on the fact that historically, in early April, 25 commodity and farm organizations joined me in writing a letter to the federal Liberal government, and we made sure our provincial Liberal counterparts were well aware of it as well. With this letter, we provided proof of how the federal carbon tax is crippling the production of food here in Ontario and across Canada. You know, we have all kinds of references. I have a bill in front of me right now that just earlier this year, before that 23 per cent increase, a farmer was paying $4,666 on his energy bill. And the member from Halliburton Kawartha Lake, she's on the ground too. She loves her farmers. And she asked specifically, what are we doing? We introduced programs to help farmers cope with the devastating ideology that is crippling and causing the cost of production to go up. It's Mental Health Week, farm, our speaker. And I'm so proud that one of the many programs we Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the minister for her incredible advocacy for our farmers. I know my farmers are frustrated that the federal Liberals won't listen to them. A few weeks ago, when the Ontario Federation of Agriculture was here at Queen's Park, another local farmer from Cavan Monaghan told me that he paid $20,000 in carbon tax in just two months to dry his corn. And again, that was before the carbon tax increased by 23 per cent on April 1st. Farmers want to increase Ontario's market access, but the carbon tax is reducing their competitive advantage at the global level. The impact of the federal Liberal carbon tax can be seen whenever you visit a grocery store or a gas station. This tax impacts every level of the supply chain and needlessly takes money out of people's pockets. Enough is enough. The federal Liberal government needs to scrap the tax now. And I know the minister's question is, why will question. the federal Liberals not listen to you, the Premier, and our farmers, and are so oblivious to how it's creating such a hardship on the punishing car? Mr. Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Quite simply, Speaker, Bonnie Crombie and her crew across the floor from us just don't get it. But more importantly, they just don't care. You know, recently, and I'll never forget it, 
a Liberal member of Bonnie's crew, stood up with conviction and said, a carbon tax is good for everyone. Well, I suggest respectfully, when you look at your orchids or you consume fresh produce, you think about that 30 per cent increase in cost of production, and it's time that you start caring. A demonstrate that you understand and will join us to scrap the tax. Otherwise, they may just not care, Speaker, but I want to share with the House an example of caring that came to us from Temiskaming Shores this past week. You know what? First responders and OPP officers made sure that a barn fire did not spread to our spud unit, saving Response. valuable seed for potato, garlic, strawberries and raspberries. And right now, I would like to thank on behalf of Hillside Farms and all of Ontario, I want to thank first responders and I want to thank Mr. Aitchison, who ran into a burning barn with six OPP officers from the Temiskaming Department to save 130 head of cattle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The next question, the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. Nosies are a type of lien against property commonly used today to scam and extort Ontarians across our province, especially our seniors. Earlier this year, the Ontario NDP tabled a bill to ban them and put an end to this abuse. The minister said he agreed with us, but here we are two months later and we are still waiting while homeowners continue to get scammed. Will the minister commit today to banning these secretive, harmful liens against homes in Ontario, and if so, Tell us when he will make it into law. The Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This government, under the leadership of our Premier, stands for promises made, promises kept. A promise was made in this House to eradicate nosies, to protect our seniors and our most vulnerable. That promise will be kept. There are many weeks ahead in this legislative spring session. So I say to the member opposite, thank you for the question. Stay tuned and always count on our Premier and this government to stand up for our seniors, for our fellow citizens in need. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the Minister. But you know, we are in a race against time right now because every day a new nosy is being secretly laid or a new homeowner is stunned and scammed when they try to sell or remortgage their home. Speaker, there are countless Ontarians with these secretive, harmful liens on their homes, including an elderly couple in my community with a dozen of them, totaling more than $100,000. I recently wow. tabled a motion calling on the government to immediately notify all homeowners who have these liens on their homes because the people deserve to know. So will the minister support this important motion? Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and for the question uh, from the member opposite. Uh, my ministry so far has brought forth two pieces of legislation that has gained the support, the unanimous support of this House, and of course that includes the member opposite and his caucus. And I hope and believe that when further thoughtful legislation is tabled in this House for further consumer protection, for further eradication of consumer harms like nosies, I hope and believe that we can speedily pass it through this House with the support of the members opposite. I trust that they will thoughtfully consider their options in that regard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Solicitor General. It is clear to everyone except for the federal Liberals and their provincial counterparts, sure. that the carbon tax is detrimental to Ontario's economy. Right. After last month's 23 per cent tax hike, people are increasingly concerned about how this regressive tax is affecting our public safety system. With reports of increasing crime levels, troubling Ontarians across this great province, families in my riding of Newmarket Aurora are concerned about the safety of themselves and their loved ones. Speaker, Ontario depends on our police and our firefighters to protect their communities. It is critical for them to have the tools and the resources they need to do their jobs. Speaker, 
Can the Solicitor General tell the House how the carbon tax impacts our public safety system? To reply, Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague and friend from Newmarket Aurora, and also to say that tonight in the York Regional Police Service there will be a dinner honouring those from victim services who work hard every day to make sure that the victims are always protected. Mr. Speaker, there is no doubt, there is no doubt in anybody's mind whatsoever that the carbon tax affects public safety. And let me give it by the numbers to the member opposite. An average SUV that might consume 100 litres of fuel at 18 cents per litre for gas that's $18 per fill-up. When you multiply it per year, because these cars are always on the road, you're talking $6,500 a year just for the gas on the carbon tax portion. Bonds. Bonnie Crombie knows this because she served on the board of Peel Police Service. She should tell the truth and say she knows this is affecting our public safety. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Solicitor General for his response. It is essential that Ontario families feel protected and secure in their communities. And I'm proud that our government is supporting our first responders and calling on the federal government to scrap the carbon tax. Speaker, Ontarians across this province want an end to this tax, as the carbon tax drives up the prices for fuel and equipment. People are justifiably concerned about how these added costs will strain police services. Our frontline officers keep us safe, and they deserve our support. That's why the federal Liberals need to listen to what Ontarians are saying and finally eliminate this harmful Question. carbon tax. Speaker, could the Solicitor General tell the House how the Liberal carbon tax is impacting their operations on frontline? The Solicitor General. And thank you again, Mr. Speaker. The member is right. Every vehicle that is fueled on public safety or on firefighting effects is affected by the carbon tax. And the numbers are substantial. Just you know, to fill an average fire truck of 200 litres with 21.5 cents for diesel, which is just the carbon tax portion, means that they're paying almost $15,000 a year, if you can believe it, just for the carbon tax portion. And you know, Mr. Speaker, you know who knew about this? Bonnie Crombie. As the mayor of Mississauga, she knew the budget for the Mississauga Fire Department. She knew the budgets for the Peel Police Service budget because she was on that board too. It's time that Bonnie Crombie Spons. tells the truth, owns up to it, calls her friend Justin Trudeau and say, I'm not in favour of this tax. That concludes our question period for this morning.